Our Father and our God in heaven, I'm so thankful, humbling myself before you, bowing my head down, looking and seeking for an experience that Jesus Christ experienced us. Your voice came down from heaven declaring, this is my well-beloved son, listen you to him. We are adopted and so I believe and I'm adopted son and I am praying that your voice may be heard through me, that your people may listen. It's my prayer by faith in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> All right. Uh, thank you again for the opportunity. We are going to get started with that subject. And what I'm going to do is to share my screen. And there we go. Uh, the subject is the rejection of Christ in the Sunday Adventist Church. And today we are looking at the 1888 message, the rejection of the message of righteousness by faith, the rejection of Christ in the Sunday Adventist Church, um, 1888 message. This is what we are looking at today. Look together with me at what Ellen White says. And uh, this is pretty important when the church is weighed in the balances of the sanctuary, it is found wanting, having left its first love. Now look at that. What verse does Ellen White quote in regard to this subject? Revelation chapter 3. The true witness declares, I know thy works and thy labor, thy patience, and how thou cannot bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast born, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Revelation 2, sorry. Notwithstanding all these, the church is found wanting. What is the fatal deficiency? What is it that the church lacks? Ellen White says, Thou hast left your first love. This is the message to the Ephesians church, or the church of Ephesians. Is not this our case? Our doctrines may be correct. I'm starting with this subject. We may hate false doctrine. She's writing in 1880s, and we are going to look at those quotes all the way to early 19, 1890s. And you're going to find out that she has some consistency. There is correct doctrine. And she's not writing to anyone who has apostatized. She's writing to men and women who are faithful members of the church, leading men in the church, who are holding fast to the truth. She says we may hate false doctrines and may not receive those who are not true to principle. We may labor with untiring energy. But even this is not sufficient. What is our motive? What are we called upon to repent? Then she says, thou hast left the first love. We are told in testimonies for the church, the church has turned back from following Christ, a leader. What happens when you turn back from following Christ? You turn your back on Christ. And then he says, and he's steadily retreating towards Egypt. What is in Egypt? There's false worship in Egypt, idol worship, and so on. And then White says, this is in 1873. I needed to put this in its right uh, time and place. 1873, she writes, What greater deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they are right when they are all wrong? There is no deception as bad as that deception that I think I am right when in reality I am all wrong. This was the condition of the church. It's not yet 1888, but she's saying, what greater deception can come upon human minds than a confidence that they're right when they're all wrong? 
continues, she says on that subject, what greater deception can come upon human minds than the confidence that they're right when they're all wrong. Now she quotes the message to Laodicea. Not Ephesus. Ephesus is the first church. Now she quotes the message to Laodicea. She says, the message of the true witness finds the people of God in a sad deception. Yet honest in that deception. They know not their condition is deplorable in the sight of God. And she, in 1888, in the midst of the controversy over the book of Galatians especially, and the message of righteousness by faith, she writes, the fact concerning the real condition of the professed people of God speak more loudly than their profession. And make it evident that some power has cut, listen to that construction, some power has cut the cable that anchored them to the eternal rock. That means they are left loose. The cable that anchored them to the eternal rock has been cut. There is no connection. And they are drifting away to the sea without chart and compass. Where was the direction that the people of God were taking? And then White uses the language, they are drifting away to the sea without chart and compass. Let's continue. 1892, Ellen White writes, the time of the test is just upon us. The loud cry of the third angel's message, look at the tense, has already begun. Has already begun. Past or present continuous. Present continuous tense. The loud cry of the third angel's message has, she does not say will begin, has already begun in the revelation of Christ. So at 1888, she says, there is already a beginning of the swelling of the third angel's message into a loud cry. In the message of righteousness of Christ, the sin pardoning redeemer, she says, this is the beginning of the light of the angel whose glory is to fill the whole earth. Which book is that? Revelation 18. So she brings Revelation 18 to the event of 1888. All right, let's continue. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 8, page 247. She says again, in the balances of the sanctuary, she now does not say the church. She is now particular to which church. The seventh day Adventist church is to be weighed. She will be judged by the privileges and advantages that she has had. If her spiritual experience does not correspond to the advantages that Christ at infinite cost as bestowed on her, if the blessings conferred her not have not qualified her to do the work entrusted to her, on her will, on her will be pronounced the sentence found wanting by light bestowed the opportunities given the Seventh Day Adventist Church will be judged. We church has been put in the balances of the sanctuary. The someday Adventist church is to be weighed. She is going to be judged. Will she be found wanting? She writes a letter to O.A. Olson, September 1892. A bit of this history is important for you. The cleansing of the sanctuary can never be complete until the Minneapolis incident of our history is fully understood and the tragic mistake rectified. 
picked this from the book 1888, Messages Reexamined. The sin committed in what took place at Minneapolis remains on the record books of heaven, registered against the names of those who resisted light. And it will remain upon the record until confession is made and transgressors stand in full humility before God. These sins were recorded in heaven. I will show you in this study that these sins hindered Jesus Christ from coming to take his people home around 1888. It was bigger than just the rejection of the message of righteousness by faith. And we'll see the events in a short while. Revelation 3 verse 20. The laudation message ends by saying, Behold, I stand at the door. Who is the I? Christ. And knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come to him and will sup with him and he with me. Pause and reconsider. The I is Jesus. Jesus is in the middle of the candlestick. But when it comes to the church of Laodicea, Jesus is absolutely outside. Why is he outside? I stand at the door and knock. Do you knock if you are inside? No. The Laodicean church has rejected Christ. Christ is outside. This is how it's put in Colossians 1 verse 26. Even the mystery which has been hid from ages and from generation, but now is made manifest to his saints. To whom God would make known what is the riches of glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. What is our hope to glory? The first angel's message calls us to fear God and give him glory. What is that hope to giving God glory? Christ in you. Was Christ abiding in Laodicea? No, Christ was locked out. He was begging to come in, into their theology, into their churches, into their experience. The church rejected the presence of Jesus. It became a chabot. Without the presence of God, the glory of God left the presence of a people professed to be his. And why? Because the people did not by heart and by word of mouth and by action accept his presence. How could they preach the gospel, the everlasting gospel? Songs of Solomon 5, 2 to 5. I sleep, but my heart waketh. It is the voice of my beloved that does what? Knocketh. Jesus is knocking. This is a love song between the bride and Christ. Saying, open to me, my sister, my love, my dove, my undefiled. My head is filled with dew and my locks with the drops of the night. I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? Says the bride. I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? My beloved put his hand by the hole of the door. And my bowels were moved for him. I rose up to open my beloved. To my beloved and my hands dropped with mire and my fingers with sweet smelling mire upon the hands of the lock. I opened to my beloved, but my beloved had withdrawn himself. What a sad state. And was gone. My soul failed when he spake. I sought him, but look at what he says. But I could not find him. I called him, but he gave me no answer. Hmm. The beloved had left. And why? The other verse says, I have put off my coat. How shall I put it on? I have washed my feet. How shall I defile them? Ellen White wrote in the beautiful book. This book is a compilation from different writings of Ellen White about the story of Christ. And Ellen White says the principles that man, the principle, and man can save himself by his own works. 
lay at the foundation of every Eden religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Saturn had implanted this principle wherever it is held. Men have no barrier against sin. Mm. Remember that that one message that brought the papal system crumbling to its knee was the message of justification by faith by Martin Luther. It is that message that broke the darkness of the papal heresy. Now we are told the principle that man can save himself by his own work lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. Did the Jews need a Martin Luther? Maybe. Their experience in principle, they were where the system of papacy would be many years, or I would say the system of papacy, which was once a church of God, came to where the Jews were, where now salvation was by works, and it says the principle that man can save himself by his own work lay at the foundation of every heathen religion. It had now become the principle of the Jewish religion. We are told in the same book that people whom God had called to be the pillar and the ground of truth had become representatives of Satan. I want you to think about it a little bit. They had become representatives of Satan. The Jewish nation was no longer representative of God. When the wise man came, they went straight to the temple, hoping to find information in regarding the born king. To their amazement, the son Adrian, the priests and the high priest had no clue. They had studied the prophecies in vain. Christ was born among his people, rejected among his people, and they say, away with him, we have no king but Caesar. Christ was rejected in 31 AD by a man that kept the seventh day Sabbath, men that paid tithes and offerings, men that were most pious in the universe. Those are the people that crucified Christ. And Ellen White says they had become representatives of Satan. We could continue reading. They were doing the work that he desired them to do, taking a course to misrepresent the character of God and cause the world to look upon him as a tyrant. The very priests who ministered in the temple had lost the sight of the significance of the service they performed. They had ceased to look beyond the symbol to the things signified in presenting the sacrificial offerings, they were as actors in a play. Churches today are more of clubs. I don't know about your place. In my country, church is a club. People go to church depending on where my class is. There is a class that when I get to financially, I don't go to some churches, I have to change my church. I have to change who I associate with. The pastor changes who he associates with. The elders, the same. They are chosen that way by the amount of offerings you give. It's sort of an act is in a play. It was happening in the Jew system. It's happening today. The ordinances which God himself had appointed were made the means of blinding the mind and hardening the heart. God could do no more for man through these channels. The whole system must be swept away. The message given to A.T. Jones, 1892, and E.J. Wagner, young men who are not even trained to be pastors, are now being called into ministry to bear a special message, a doctor and a lawyer. 
is the message of God to the Laodicean church. The heart of the 1888 message, the rebuke in the 1888 message was the message to the Laodicean church. It applies to us now than ever, never before. I have constantly said that the, me the message to Laodicea is the message to the Seventh-day Adventist church. The three angels' messages are a message we bear and, 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 and present to the world. It's a special message by which we are cut from the quarry of the world. But the warning that is now ours that we have to receive is the message to Laodicea. Because that's the condition of God's people then and now. The message given by A.T. Jones and E.J. Wagona is the message of God to the Laudations. 2,300 days, 70 days or weeks were given. Cut off of the 2,300 days are decreed upon the Jewish nation to fulfill certain requirements. And we'll find that we have also been given that opportunity as the Seventh-day Adventist Church to repent, to confess, to stop criticizing, and to ask God for forgiveness. What did we do with the opportunity that God has given us? This was time to finish transgression. This was time to make an end of sin. This was time to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up the vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy. What did they do with that 70 weeks? 31 AD, the end of 60, uh, at the end of 20, at 31 AD, uh, at the death of Jesus, we know that the ministry, the, the ministers rejected Jesus. The son Edwin, the priests, they generally rejected Jesus. 34 AD, the laity had rejected Jesus. The compact majority had rejected Jesus. The people who had an appeal, I mean, who was still, they all rejected Jesus. That is why at 34 AD, the gospel had to leave the confines of the Jews nation. We will find out that in the Seventh-day Adventist church, the rejection of truth started by the ministers. Then it went to the laity. There was a time that the laity was the most powerful tool used of God to warn the church. People like M. L. Unbrezen, men that stood firm for the truth against the errors which were being propagated, wrote letters and wrote books. Great controversy says to us the history of ancient Israel is a striking illustration of the past experience of the Adventist body. God led his people in the Advent movement, even as he led the children of Israel from Egypt. In the great disappointment, their faith was tested, as was that of the Hebrews at the Red Sea. Look at this now. It was not the will of God that Israel should wander 40 days or 40 years in the wilderness. He desired to lead them directly to the land of Canaan and establish them there, a holy people and a happy people. But they could not enter in because of unbelief. Hebrews 3 verse 19. Because of their backsliding and apostasy, they perished in the desert and others were raised up to enter the promised land. In like manner, just the same way, it was not the will of God that the coming of Christ should be so long delayed. And his people should remain so many years in this world of sin and sorrow, but unbelief separated them from God. As they refused to do the work which he had appointed them to do, Others who are raised to proclaim the same message in mercy to the world, Jesus delayed his coming. The sinners may have an opportunity to hear the warning and find him a shelter before the wrath of God shall be poured out. You can see that 1844, the most holy place, with the third angel's message being preached, the end of the most holy place. 1848, the Sabbath message is preached, a special message for them. Uh, after Jesus opened the door of the most holy place, 1844, the light on the Sabbath was seen, 1848, and the people of God were tested upon that subject, as the children of Israel were tested anciently to see if they would keep God's law. 
I saw the third angel's message pointing upward, showing the disappointed ones the way to the holiest of the heavenly sanctuary. 1888, about 40 years, or 40 plus years, God comes to his people with the message of righteousness by faith. Right on time, at the age of 23, man, at the age of 23, A.T. Jones, an officer in the United States Army, became a Seventh-day Adventist. An honest, studious, self-made man, he qualified himself for the ministry, which he ended in 1885. He soon distinguished himself as an associate editor of the Science of the Time. Soon he was joined by a physician turned minister, Dr. E.J. Wagoner at the General Conference of 1888. The two led out in the presentation on the righteousness by faith. They carried the strong, they, 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 they carried the strong support of Ellen White as advocate of this precious truth. When she could, she traveled and worked with them for two years following the sessions, carrying the message to the churches, ministerial institutes, institutions, and camp meeting. Young men were raised from their profession. During that time, there is an attempt to pass the National Sunday Law. Now listen carefully. During the time that they are preaching this message, there is an attempt to pass the National Sunday Law. 1888, the Blair Sunday Rest Bill. To secure to the people the enjoyment of the first day of the week, commonly known as the Lord's Day, as the day of rest, and to promote its observance as the day of worship. This bill is introduced into the Senate by Senator Blair. For hearing, there's an attempt to pass this. And I'll, I'll be going over this because this is an overview. At the commencement of the Holy Sabbath, January 5th, 1949, winds begin to be released. Early writings say this. I saw that the four angels would hold the four winds until Jesus' work was done in the sanctuary. What chapter of the Bible is that? Revelation chapter 7. And then will come the seven last plagues. That's the sealing message. Right. Look at what she says in 37 paragraph 1. My attending angel directed me to the city of God again. When I saw four angels winging their way to the gate of the city. They were just presenting the golden card to the angel. They were going to heaven and they were going to present a golden card to the angel at the gate. When I saw another angel flying swiftly from the direction of the most excellent glory and crying with a loud voice to the angels and waving something up and down in his hand, I asked my tending angel for an explanation of what I saw. He told me that I could not, I could see no more then, but he would shortly show me what those things then uh, that I then saw meant. Let's continue. Afternoon, January 6th, 1849. The wedding we asked. Sabbath afternoon, the spirit fell upon me and I was taken off in a vision. Same event. 37 paragraph 2 of the writings. I saw four angels who had a work to do on earth and were on their way to accomplish it. Jesus was clothed with priestly garment. Note that. 38 paragraph 1. He guessed in pity on the remnant then raised his hand and with voice of deep piety cried, my blood, father, my blood, my blood, my blood. Four times there was a cry from Christ. Then I saw an exceeding bright light come from God who sat upon the great white throne and was shed all about Jesus. Then I saw an angel commissioned from Jesus, swiftly flying towards the four angels who had a work to do on earth and waving something up and down and crying with a loud voice, hold, 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 until the servants of God 
are sealed in their forehead. That's Revelation chapter 7. So there's angels that are going up and it seems the work is getting over. The winds are beginning to blow. There is an opportunity to pass the Sunday law. Events are turning so fast between Revelation 11, I would say, between Revelation 13 and Revelation 16, the plagues. And what's happening is Jesus looks down and he cries, my blood, my blood, my blood. He cries to the Father. And in the cry of Jesus, there is a response from the Father through the angels. Hold, hold, hold. So it means that the message of Revelation chapter 77 is a message to hold the four winds of the earth until my servants are sealed. Let's continue. 1882. About to let the four winds go. 1882 is the last future tense printing of this vision. I asked my accompanying angel the meaning of what I had. Look at the date, 1882. And what the four angels were about to do. He said to me that it was God that restrained the powers and that he gave his angels charge over things on earth that the four angels had power from God to hold the four winds. And that they were about to let the four winds go. But while their arms were losing and the four winds were about to blow, the merciful eye of Jesus gazed on the remnant that were not sealed. God's people, not ready. And he raised his hand to the Father and pleaded with him that he, might, he, he had spilled his blood for them. Then another angel was commissioned to fly swiftly to the four angels and bid them hold Hold, hold until the servants of God were sealed with the seal of the living God in their forehead. Which year is that? 1892. Let's get to history. 1888, same vision comes. But now in a different, the prophet saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor the sea, nor on any tree. Another angel ascending from the east cried to them, Heart not the earth, neither the sea, nor the tree, till the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. This points out the work we now have to do, which is to cry that God may hold the four, for the angels to hold the four winds until missionaries shall be sent to all parts of the world and shall have to proclaim the warning against disobeying the law of Jehovah. Let me pause and tell you something. This same year that Ellen White wrote this, she also wrote that the missionaries of Christ shall go around the globe, the earth, preaching that there is one God, the Father, and Jesus Christ, his Son. Here she's saying the reason why the angels are too old was this, so that Missionaries shall be sent to all parts of the world and shall have to proclaim the warning against disobeying the law of Jehovah. 1897, she speaks in past tense. The angels would not have come. The Lord God is jealous, yet he bears long with the sins and the transgressions of the people in this generation. If the people of God had walked in his counsel, the work of God would have advanced. The messages of truth would have been born to all people that dwell on the face of the whole earth. Had the people of God believed him and been doers of the word, had they kept his commandments, the angels would not have come flying through heaven with the message to the four angels that were to let loose the winds that they should blow upon the earth, crying, hold, hold, the four winds, that they blow not upon the earth until I have sealed the servants on their forehead. And so we see again, this is a past tense. Those angels would have not, Jesus would have come. But what happened in the Advent movement that Jesus was not able to come at this moment, around 1880s? What was the thing going on in the Advent movement that restrained Jesus? They had rejected Christ in the person of the precious message of righteousness by faith. 
they had criticized the messengers that were bearing this message. We'll see this in a little bit. 1908, she writes again in a past tense. We are standing in the threshold of great and solemn events. Prophecies are fulfilling. Strange and eventful histories being recorded in the books of heaven. Events which it was declared should shortly precede the great day of God. Everything in the world is in an unsettled state. The nations are angry and the great preparations for the war are being made. Nation is plotting against nation and kingdom against kingdom. The great day of God is hastening greatly. But although the nations are mastering their forces for war and bloodshed, the command to the angel is still in force that they should hold the four winds until the servants of God are sealed in their forehead. 1849 to 1882, they were about to let the four winds go. 1888, the work we now have to do, cry to God that the angels may hold, present. 1897, had the people of God believed him and been doers of his word, had they kept his commandment, passed. 1909, passed. The command to hold is still in force. That means that the very pivot of these events is 18. 88. The Sunday law movement of the 1880 is directly related to the angel's message to old. The time is coming when we cannot sell at any price. The decree will go soon forth prohibiting men to buy or sell of any, save him that hath the mark of the beast. We came near having realized this, having realized in California a short time since. But this was only the threatening of the blowing of the four winds. As yet, they are held by the four angels. We are not just ready. There is a work yet to be done, and the angels will be bidden to let go, that the four winds may blow upon the earth. We are told, the prophet saw four angels standing in the four corners of the earth. And he says, this points out the work we now have to do, which is to cry for the angels to hold the four winds of the earth that missionaries might be sent. Again, this quote comes over and over again. I don't want to read it. I want to go to another one. Um, we have the 1948. The church is in Laudation state, and the cry to the church is Revelation 3. The condition of the church, the Laudation condition. The Laudation message goes all the way and brings the people of God to the time when actually the latter reign must begin, when they accept that message. 1888 turns at the people. Righteousness by faith takes up. The laudation message is revived. There is a shaking in the preaching of the laudation message. There is a latter in and loud cry. There is a close probation. The people of God are sealed. The plagues come. The time of Jacob's trouble. There's a second advent. The righteousness of Christ is pure, unadulterated truth. I want you now to listen to me carefully because there are things I want to bring up before the people of God at this particular hour, uh, at this particular hour. Uh, yeah, with the few minutes that we have left. Now, what are these things that we want to learn right now? I'm trying to, to get that screen shared so that we complete. Good. We have about 12 minutes. Now look at this. We've realized that at around 1888, Jesus would have come. At 1888, there's a message that is being preached. The message is righteousness by faith. 
And we've now realized that there is a message being directed to the movement of God. It's the laudation message. What does the laudation message say? It's saying that this is the moment you are poor, you are blind, you are wretched. That is what you are, but you are saying we are increased with goods. We have a need of nothing. When the reality is you are blind, you are naked, you are poor, you are all those things. Ladies and friends, in 1888, the sermons that are preached by this man, A.T. Jones, this is a book that I have in my library, The Consecrated Way to Christian Perfection. He outlines in his sermons a path to Christian perfection. And in his sermons, there is something that is so key. Listen to me carefully now. One, righteousness by faith. Two, the true identity of Christ, his divinity and his human nature. Listen carefully. 1888. So, E.J. Wagona in his sermons writes about Christ and his righteousness. The issue at 1888 is more than just the law in Galatians. It's more than just the subject of whether we are saved by works or not. There are issues that were underlying the 1888 message. Look at the contents which I've taken a screenshot of there. This is the contents of the little book consecrated a way to Christian perfection. What is the first chapter? Such an high priest. What is the second chapter? Christ as God. What is the third chapter? Christ as man. What is the fourth chapter? He took part of the same. And it continues and continues. Let's continue. Look at the other book, Christ and His Righteousness. These were sermons that were given by these two gentlemen. And Ellen White called these messages a precious message from heaven. Look at the messages there. Christ and His Righteousness. How shall we consider Christ? Is Christ God? Christ as the Creator? Is Christ a created being? God manifested in the flesh? And you continue and continue and continue. Pause with me. Let's ask ourselves a few questions. Have these questions not recently rose again in the Seventh-day Adventist cycles? Are we now not asking again? In the 1950s, especially 1957, and I have that in another presentation, the evangelical earthquake, the two men approached our leading leaders and ask them if Seventh-day Adventist was a cult. If they were cult, they would put them in a book that they were writing. And so, they questioned our doctrines. Walter Martin and Barnos, when they approached our leading men, what did our leading men do? The likes of whom decided to produce a book which was rejected by the laity and the general church. The name of that book was Questions on Doctrine. In 1950s, we plainly rejected the pioneer, the spirit of prophecy position on the nature of Christ as man. Questions on Doctrine was a book that was answering the question asked by evangelicals on the beliefs of Christ on which subject? How we are saved? Righteousness by faith? Who is Christ to Seventh-day Adventists? That was the big question. What is his nature as man? Was Christ a created being? And is Christ our creator? Who is Christ? That was the question. What is the question that Christ asked his disciples? Who say ye that I am? Are these questions that were asked that tended towards the 1888 messages, questions that are in the cycles of Adventism today, it goes without being said again. People like one, uh, Willand wrote the book, 
1888 message re-examined, bringing up the practicability of what happened during that time. The message of righteousness by faith has been corporately rejected. And none of these people have made a public confession, the leading brethren, of what happened in 1888. Messages have been brought before the general conference over and over again. Have there been a repentance? Now there is a conversation around who is Christ to Seventh-day Adventists. Every single quarterly lesson says something about Christ, the Trinity, God, and so on. Look at one of the things that they presented in 1888. What then is the thought concerning Christ in the first chapter of Hebrews? First of all, there is introduced God, God the Father, as the speaker to man. When in the time past, spake unto the fathers by the prophets, and who hath in this last day spoken to us by his son. Thus is introduced Christ, the Son of God. Then of him and the Father, is written, whom he, the Father, hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he, the Father, made the world. Thus, as preliminary to the introduction and our consideration of him as the high priest, Christ, the Son of God, is introduced as being with God as the creator and as being active, vivifying word in the creation, by whom also he, God, made the world. Next, of the Son of God himself we read, who being the brightness of his, God's glory, and express image of his, God's person, in every very impress, in the very impress of his substance, in and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had made, he had by himself piled our sins, sat on the right hand of the majesty on earth. This tells us that in heaven, the nature of Christ was the nature of God. That he, in his person, in his substance, is the very impress of the very character of the substance of God. That is to say that in heaven, as it was before he came to the world, the nature of Christ was in the very substance, the nature of God the Father. And so Christ becomes God by sharing the same nature. Go back and see what were the messages preached in 1888. The foundation of the message of righteousness by faith was in the identity of Christ. If you find the identity of Christ wrong, you cannot teach righteousness by faith. If the church claims to be teaching righteousness by faith, they are like the Jews that claim to be teaching the same by offering sacrifices while they denied Christ as the Son of God and crucified him. You're right. These were the messages you can see on your screen that these people taught in 1888. They taught is Christ God. Who is Christ? Christ as the creator. Is Christ a created being? Today, Adventist theologians are debating about this. Was it not part of the 1888 message? If we read the books where A.T.A. E.J. Wagoner at, at that time, before they left and stripped off the faith, Ellen White holds those books as messages from heaven. If the church today rejects these messages as they were delivered by these two gentlemen, whom Ellen White says were messengers of God, are they not guilty of the sins that the leading men were guilty of in 1888? that Ellen White says was written upon the books of heaven. Have God not used laymen that were not trained ministers to bring this message before them? Listen, Gother W. A. to Pearson in 71, page 3. Statements in regard to the book Movement of Destiny and Questions on Doctrines you're about to finish. I want to read for you from paragraph 2 there. Thus, by careful analysis, the whole structure of Froome's thesis in regard to what were the underlying issues of 1888 falls. What needs to be done, Elder Pearson, I think is the president at this time, is for this book, this must be uh, the destiny of our movement. I have that book in hard copy in my library. What needs to be done, Elder Pearson, is for this book to be recalled and a confession be made to the ministry and the laity of the church 
that the book contains errors and its conclusion in regard to 1888 are based on faulty scholarship. This is the least that is owed to the church. The very fact that both you and Elder Wilson have placed our imprimatur upon the book makes it doubly necessary for you to act in the interest of truth and righteousness. Then he says, may God help us to make this great second advent movement a movement of destiny through the exaltation of truth and truth alone and not through error or sub, uh, subterfuge. Sincerely yours. W. H. Grother, or, or Grother. I want us to understand, because I want to stop sharing the screen. Our time is, is over. But I want to say this. Look at those concepts that have been brought to us. In, in 1980, the church rejected the position that was held by our pioneers. And when I talk about our pioneers, I'm talking about Ellen White as well. They rejected the position which was presented as the foundation. If E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones at 1888 were so wrong on a subject that would have people disfellowshipped today from fellowship, why were they not disfellowshipped then? It would only mean then that uh, either the brethren that time were mature while the brethren were wrong, or they basically were wrong. And they had no grounds of removing these brethren from fellowship. Number two, in the presence of a living prophet, it could only be true now in the absence of a living prophet that if the church today stands in the position that contradicts the position of these two gentlemen at that particular time, then the church could be wrong. And if the church is wrong, then we ask the question, have we not rejected Christ as it was rejected in 1888? I think yes. The church of the Jews rejected Christ and became representatives of Satan. And God could do no more through that China. In 31 AD, they crucified Christ. In 34 AD, everyone rejected Christ. Destruction came in 70 AD. Now, 1888, Christ was rejected by the ministers in the person of the message of justification by faith. 57, 56, 1957, a book was produced that countered the understanding of the identity of Christ, Christ being in taking the nature of fallen Adam. That position was challenged by writing the book Questions on Doctrines, and we evaded being called Cuts. 1980, we completely rejected that concept. And now we are a fully, completely Trinitarian church with a complete rejection of that old position. We are drifting back to Egypt. We've turned away from Christ. May the message of Laodicea come again to us. Remember the words, Christ is knocking. Will he come in? He's out of Laodicea. And Christ in you is the only hope of glory. Christ out of you, you have no hope for glory. No gospel. No first angel's message, for the first angel's of message is fear God and give him glory. May God bless us. Our time is over. In Jesus Christ's name, amen. Amen. Thank you, uh, dear brother, for a powerful message. You know, I have some questions. Uh, when we go back to 1957, do you know how did God's people react? You know, uh, when Leroy Froome came and changed up and came up with the doctrine, the question of doctrine. How did God's people who knew what they believed before, how did they re react when they tried to change our doctrine? I think the lady rejected the position of Larry Froome. But the scholars at that time were buying the idea. 
The book was distributed, but it didn't take ground. Soon enough, it was met by the messages and the distribution of papers that say the contrary view on the subject of atonement. So, yeah. so yes, the church, the church was quite aware and the, the lady, the common man who was studying the Bible, rejected that position of the church through their ministers. Yeah. So they were kind of brainwashed before that happened. So when they, they accepted it, when it came. That's right. It took time. It took time for people to accept these doctrines officially. But I think the ministerial side was able to take it because it became also something to be taught in the colleges. And so colleges were used as a means to indoctrinate people. So it started there and then slowly came 1888 and then they rejected, you know, the whole thing. In 1888, what we understand is they reject the messages that are presented by E.J. Wagoner, but especially on the issues of the law of Galatians. But there was more to it. And that's what we've shown, because at that time, they are in agreement on the, on the identity of Christ in terms of his nature, I mean, his nature. They, they are on agreement on the subject of uh, Christ as being a divine son of God. They are on agreement on the human nature of Christ. So the, the issue here is the law, uh, the law and the place of the law in, 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 uh, in the book of Galatians. But as time goes by, we've seen other segments of that message rejected. Now, not necessarily people debating on that law, but now we have debated on other parts of that message, which even the church then agreed on, like the nature of Christ, the identity of Christ as the Son of God. We now are debating that part. And we are now debating on the nature of Christ as well. So when it comes to, um, uh, we had 1919, and then we had um, 1957. On the 1950s, the evangelical earthquake into, the, into Adventism. And we get a blow, a book is produced, an official book that I also got from my father, Questions on Doctrines, and is given to people answering the questions that were raised by the evangelicals. But on which side? On the side whereby Fum is trying as much as possible to correct the old, the old position of Adventism. And then 1980, finally, we wrap a stamp by putting all these things together into a fundamental belief book. So do you think the bottom line is that God's people, they load sin more than they load Christ? They did not want to have victory over sin because they didn't want to call sin by its name? Maybe so, but I also think that as soon as we drifted into the laudation state, we thought that we were rich and we had a need of nothing. We knew everything. We could not be corrected. And that's the position of any man when he grows. I mean, uh, I want to give her, our brother there has something beautiful. Oh, uh, Asher, please. Yeah. I'm going to speak in Norse, because I'm not so good at English. But you can maybe translate it. Oh, then you have to speak very slowly. It goes well. It's very short. Here we have this book, Christ and His Righteousness. Here we have this book, Christ and His Righteousness. It's on Danish, though. In Danish. I think you should be a little careful with this because I think you have to cut it with this. I think you should be a little bit careful reading this because I think that uh, some leaders have, uh, you know, changed what is some of what is written there. I think the English one is more right. Wow, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, that's interesting. So, um, yeah, thank you for sharing that, uh, Hasse. Uh, so, um, what was I going to say? So, um, you were talking about church being a club. So, when you speak to people in the church today, are they just satisfied with the situation, going to church, having potluck, going home? Are they satisfied with that? kind of Christianity? I think they are in a laudation state, largely. And I pray, I mean, I am not trying to put myself out of this. Most of us need the laudation message to wake us and arouse us out of that slumber. 
we are all in that state of feeling we have a need of nothing. Remember the first quote I read, um, our church, the first quote was saying that um, you might have correct doctrines and everything correct, but if we let Christ out, if we cut that cord that connects us to Christ, it's all in vain. So the church is in a situation whereby it's more of a club. It's a meeting point for people of some class um, wanting to encourage themselves. That is what is happening in many places. There is no fulfillment in our worship. And if it has to be there, it has to be canon. It has to be excited by charismatic preaching and charismatic music. So is Not it bad. That's is it, all. Is it right yeah. now to go to that church? To the club? That should be the question that we should be handling because that could be a big one because then what would be the purpose if the presence of Christ is not there? What, what would be the purpose? You know, the thing is, today we are in the situation that the Jews were in. The Jews were in a situation where they were expected to appear at Jerusalem to find salvation. They were in that situation. And they didn't know, even after Christ had come and died, they didn't know what they could do. And then now the question comes, what is important? Because now they've been thrown out, there is persecution, there is all these things. And then, then we begin hearing of meeting in homes, breaking bread, under trees, all these things. The reality is sometimes we go to church just because we have been told the church is the path to salvation. And we forget that no denomination is a path to salvation. Truth is the path to salvation. And that truth is in Christ. And the Bible says, open ye the gates, that those men that believe the truth should come in. I don't believe that a particular denomination is the path to salvation. If they reject truth, if they stand against the truth and push away the men and women who are bearing the truth, they're not safe places to be in. Right. I can see that we have Brother Wayne with us. I'm glad to see you, Brother Wayne. You usually have some good comments or questions or... You have to unmute yourself, please. How's that? Yeah, good to see you guys. Long time since last. <laughs> yes. All I can say is, oh, mercy. Right. We have experienced this in the last church that we were in. That we were members. We're still members there, but uh, uh, we are so glad that we moved away. And um, we found that, uh, in fact, Linda has been saying for years that it's nothing but a country club. And, um, you know, I, I was looking at something yesterday uh, about this. Um, uh, 20, uh, Pentecost 2025. And they want to re reestablish Pentecost in 2025 to bring so many more people, you know, they, they're I don't know. I think they're crazy. These leaders are delusional because Pentecost happened a long time ago. And um, we have, um, we've already been there and done that. The, the, what, what I see and what I've experienced <clears throat> as an officer in the church in Beaumont, California, um, the pastor would not let us speak the truth. He kept us um, under his thumb so that we couldn't preach the truth. And um, there, um, you know, it's a sad state of affairs because. Uh, Linda came into this movement in 1967. 
I came in in 1972, and it's not the same movement that we came into. Uh, Robert H. Pearson was the General Conference president at the time that we came in. And, uh, but Froome was a long time before that, and he'd already sown this, the, um, the seeds of destruction. And, and so here we are in 2024 and they're just, they're just, uh, loving to, to, uh, deceive the people that are coming in that they want to bring in. Why would I, why would I want to bring in, uh, converts? to a church that is preaching error. I may as well go to an evangelical church or a Catholic church. So um, we didn't get in on the entire program for Brother Ponte, uh, but um, what I heard was uh, interesting, very interesting. And uh, I appreciate what he's presented. We're, we're in a sad state. We're in a really sad state of affairs. And um, we haven't been in, to, in the, uh, the anti-Trinitarian movement for very long. But I'll tell you what, we can't go to church because there's no church to go to that is preaching the truth. It, it's, 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 it's pathetic. And it's sad mm. that people are being so brainwashed into this demonic um, doctrine. You have anything to say, Linda? No, I agree. So here we have it. Thank you, Wayne. Yeah, I think the good thing is that it is awakening up, that more and more people can see the truth. So, right, yeah. brother. I'm praising God for what you're saying. Amen. So, yeah, yeah so uh, just before we end here, can you please share a little bit what's going on? Can you share a little bit about your mission trips and what's going on, people receiving the truth, getting baptized, and so on? Well, uh, nothing much going on. I'm glad weekly for shared what is going on from his side. I am going for mission next week. Next week is after this week. I am meeting another group of uh, non-Adventists. These are people that I've met before and I have taught before. They are a small group of people uh, that I've shared the other time we were over here with you. And uh, we, are, we are taking the message back to them because now we are going there often because they do not know as much yet. And that's the mission that I have the week that starts after this Sabbath, there is that week, and then the following week, that's the mission trip before me now. These people are as good as Catholics, and uh, they believe everything Catholics believe. And I've had a chance to now share with them and study with them the Bible personally. We're going back there again to share with them the Bible through the weekend, from Friday through to Sunday. So. That one is a special mission that is before us. And two of them have considered joining us for the camp meeting, which starts immediately after that for the next period of, uh, of 10 days. So it will be an amazing thing for them to come over, um, sit with us, and then we have hired just a hall and we are sitting there, boarding there, and just sharing the word of God for 10 days. And we are speaking and waking up and speaking and waking up and singing and doing all those things. Uh, last time, I think people always think that if, if you do it for 10 days, you are keeping feasts. I like to say no. We are basically doing it like that because... We don't have a lot of time to meet. We are very few and 
we all have to come together once in a year and have such congregations. So it's a beautiful experience for them to come in and just sit and feed on the word of God. Sometimes we do it for two weeks. Sometimes we do it for seven days. But we will do it for 10 days to 11 days this time. Actually, it's 11 days because it's from 14th, 4th to 14th. Those are actually 11 nights. We are living on 15th. Those are actually 11 days. Just, just to be sure. So these people are going to be there. That's an interesting thing for me that they are going to come to an Advent meeting and stay there for all those days, studying the word of God together with us. That's, that's, that will be really amazing. And even celebrate the Sabbath together. I'm praying for that to happen. But even as I go there, I'm still praying because when I go there, I'm going to meet more than these two. You're going to meet other people. And who knows, maybe many of them might be interested in the truth. Amen. Praise the Lord. So, Brother Sadak, also, you know, it, it seems sometimes that uh, when these huge congregations are get, or many, many people are baptized at the same time, they have just heard a message for maybe a few days, and then, you know, hundreds and thousands of people are baptized. You know, somehow, maybe I'm wrong, but somehow I'm a little skeptical are they really converted? And of course, it's just God who can judge their hearts. But somehow, I like the way you do it. You go to a place, you preach, and then all the takes over, and they are teaching them more so that when you come back again, then they are prepared. Then they know the message and they have an experience with Christ. That's right. I mean, if we do the baptism too fast, we are just going to get where the church is as fast as we did the baptism because these people are not grounded in the truths. So I would prefer that people are left like Timothy and Paul after ministry has been done to continue with work for the next uh, months preparing them. So if we go for the camp meeting right now, most of the people going to be baptized there have been in class. They've been learning. They've been in sort of Sabbath schools. That is what we call it. Actually, it's a school. So the learning, the principles of Adventism, the key pillars. And so by the time they get into the water, they at least know. So if even if you lose some, because the devil is still alive, you might not lose as many. But if you just go for two weeks and preach and then you baptize, there's a possibility. That's what the church is doing right now. We ascend, we do two weeks. And, you know, if you baptize many, the pastor gets credentials. I mean, I mean, those numbers go up and then he's promoted and he has a lot of people coming to the church. That's not my excitement. My excitement is to see those whom I brought into the truth remain in the truth. My yeah. excitement is to see those whom I help cancel through marriage remain in marriage. That is my excitement. My excitement is not so many marriages. My excitement is not so many baptisms, my excitement is to see them remain in truth. So I sometimes tell them, there is a gentleman that we wanted to baptize. He told me, no, don't baptize me. It took him five years from that mission field. He called back and said, now I believe that truth and now I am ready to be baptized. Will you come and baptize me? Mm -hmm. I'd never gone back to that area. Five years. But everyone was telling him, now you know the Sabbath. Be baptized, be baptized. Many of the people that were baptized at that time left the church again. But he came five years and told me, will you come? He studied for himself. So we have to be patient. But I also know that there are cases where I would not necessarily need to delay a man. We must pray and understand the situation as it is. There is a case of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. The man had been studying the Bible for sure. For him to get to a point where he was now struggling with the book of Isaiah. So there are cases where if, for example, I met an Adventist pastor that I know has been studying the truth but had this point of doctrine different. And he says, you know what? I have accepted the truth. I am excited about this truth. I want to work for God. And I am feeling in my own capacity. God is compelling me that I need to be baptized. I won't tell him stay in class for six months. Because I know he's being in truth. But if I meet a brand new person, I must ask him questions in regard to his belief and then know what to do from there. So we need to be patient with the 
uh, baptizing people. I mean, we need to go slow and do it when it is right. Amen. Praise the Lord. So are there more questions or comments? Yes. Yeah, brother. Linda has a question. Or My question is, um, what happens if people aren't baptized? I know that in the Catholic Church that I came out of many years ago, um, they they had a place for, for unbaptized people. But in the Adventist Church, you know, it's never been a problem because we were in it. Uh, but now we're not attending. And with the possibility of studying with people, but not wanting to have them baptized into the church, but only into, into Christ. Um, and if they don't get baptized, does that mean that they forfeit salvation? I think that if you forfeit baptism while you have complete knowledge that it's a Christian obligation, you run in danger of like Jesus Christ says rather through the words of John, because you rejected the baptism of John, you rejected the counsels of God. So sometimes I think that they run into being guilty of rejecting the counsels of God's word. And God saves us through his word. So if you have a cl classic knowledge that God is calling you to be baptized after coming into a knowledge of truth, you should ideally be baptized. And if you forfeit that opportunity, you run at risk of being lost because of rejecting a plain word of God. We live by the word. So I think people Amen. should not just be there to study and study and study. We, we, we are also a child that believes that baptism is a means of entrance into the church and the church is the pillar and the ground of truth. It's a public communication to the world that are making decisions right. to stand with this group of people that have made a decision to stand with Christ. So trying to avoid baptism is as good as trying to say, I'm with you guys, but I don't want the world to know that I'm with you guys. And that is very, if you're ashamed of Christ before the public, before the people, he will also be ashamed of you. So we don't want to be ashamed of Christ when everything is right. Thank you. But who, who would baptize them? You know, according to the church, if we haven't been through seminary, we are not uh, allowed to baptize. So what if there's no one to baptize them? It's, it's, it's a big topic. And with gospel order and organization, indeed, we cannot just have anyone baptizing for, for the sake of some order. But at the same time, there is a time that the church develops, and it's called the time of a crisis. The church is, is at its infant stages. The church in the wilderness growing, the apostolic church growing. Things are not in the perfect order. God still has a church and uses his people in that time, in the best way. And that is why at that time, a deacon is the first person we are seeing publicly baptizing. His name is Philip. He's sent of God. Today, we rarely see deacons baptized. And, and that continues. Ellen White now comes in and says, Brother Tay goes into a mission, and I've been to missions outside my country, and there is no ordained minister. Right. I have had an opportunity to be ordained, but there are cases where you go and you are not an ordained minister, but you are a missionary, you are an evangelist. And Ellen White tells Brother Tay that he ought to have baptized those people because okay. God had sent him there. So when God sends you somewhere and puts a burden of a message, with you and there is no one to take that office of baptizing you should not hesitate to baptize okay yeah so i think Here. it's okay. very important to see that uh Thank you. in life yeah God bless now i was i was ordained as an elder back in the 1970s wow and not as a minister, but as a local church elder. Yes. It's my understanding that that ordination still holds. Um, there is a, uh, there's an organization called the Universal Life Church where anybody, I, I could go there and pay 25 bucks or whatever it is and get my ministerial degree or ordination as a universal life church minister. Um, 
I've considered it. In fact, I have a, well, I know of a guy over in California that is a mortician and he got his minister. He's an Adventist, but he's, he got his um, universal life church ministerial license. And um, so when somebody who is not in the church or doesn't have a church comes to him and say, says, would you perform a funeral for my deceased loved one? He goes, goes ahead, he goes ahead and does it because he's got a ministerial license from the Universal Life Church, which is a it's a viable ministerial yeah, by state. Uh, license by state. So I've considered doing that and having our own ministry, which we have our own ministry. It's called Manument Health. It's a health ministry, but it's also a, a spiritual ministry. And um, personally, I would have a problem baptizing someone with those credentials because it is a state sanctioned entity. And uh, I mean, people like Lady Gaga and uh, all manner of um, celebrity types have this ministerial license, and they can do. You know, they can have a, a a church, or they can call their their concerts church or whatever. But anyway, my point is, you can get this, and I don't have to be a Seventh Day Adventist minister to be able to baptize somebody. I can baptize, um, perform a wedding, funerals, anything like that. And so I was just curious of what you think about that. And um, personally, over the last four years, since we've been uh, not attending church per se, I think we've attended one church since we've been here, um, I don't want anything to do with it anymore because they are not the church that I was baptized into. Yeah. So but, but, say you. I, I honestly feel and uh, think that if your ordination came at a time that you believed in what is truth, I don't know what was in your church at 1970. I do not think the ordination goes away with the passing of time. Uh, I know people who are baptized into the truth. They, they don't need any of that because they knew what the truth is. And they are part of the people that had issues with some of the, uh, some of the issues in Adventism. So <clears throat> as an elder, what happens? Baptism is the work of ordination. and Ordination is one and the same thing. It's separation for work by the laying of hands. The, right. ordination, the ordination of an elder and the ordination of a minister and a deacon is one of the same thing, but to different offices in the church. It's one and the same thing. Right. Different offices in the church. And basically, a minister is a moving elder. And so what happens is a minister can move from one place to another, establishing churches. The elder is more of a local person ministering to that church. And that's why Ellen White talked about overing pastors, pastors that were taking over the work of the elders, trying to over over one church over and over again. And that basically means to me that there are many functions, including baptism, that could be performed by elders and marriages that could be performed by elders and deacons who have been ordained. Now, as to taking ministerial uh, certification from other institutions, it depends for me with the law of the land. Uh, God does not much look at the paper, but sometimes the laws of the land can compel someone that he needs to have 
And we don't need to bring the time of trouble before it is or before it's due. And so what happens, like, I'll, I'll give you, like our state here, it's technical to run a meeting without a paper. Uh, they'll probably misunderstand you. And maybe they'll say, oh, this could be a terrorist group. You're not registered. Why are you sitting here? And sometimes because they say that for you to be able to register uh, a ministry or a church, you probably have to have a um, paper from a university as a qualified uh, university, college, whatever, but a theology paper as you're talking about. So if I had a chance to get that paper without going there, that means I'm not lying, but honestly, I could be able to get a paper to cover me. That's what I'm talking about without any fraud or whatsoever. It's clean. I'll do it for the sake of the gospel. Mm -hmm. Knowing what I believe and what I'm doing. And I think there are meetings that I've been able to cover with papers that are aimed some day Adventist per se. They are either of independent ministries, some of them that I probably don't believe exactly like, but I know that they could allow me to use their paper. And it's because the Seventh-day Adventist church cannot allow you to use their paper until God would open a way for me to get a paper that I would use. So we have to be as wise as serpents when we are doing the work of God. But what I would do is when we had a problem, we had a minister come to us who had believed every truth and had an ordination, like you have an ordination as an elder, and that minister was able, we organized a meeting and he preached. And after that, we had baptism for those who had believed. And that is where we were ordained. And once we were ordained, we believed that we had the credentials from God to be able to go forward and help other people. So everywhere we'd go to, we would ensure that if there are faithful people that are already in the truth and the church has isolated them for that work, they would also be set apart for that work. So if we have a camp meeting in a year and we have faithful people that the church has seen to be faithful, they are again ordained and set apart so that the work can be little on those who have been there before. And that's why I've also seen Sister Sue Ann asking, Sister Eva, you could just give her your email or my email. Because then when we know where she is, we might be able to know which minister is around that place that could be able to help with the baptism. Uh, there's a question on the chat that I'm referring to, Sister Eva, of someone that wants um, a minister for baptism and for marriage. So if you send your email and you send to me, then we'll be able to see who is the nearest person to where she is that can be able to help with that. But as much as possible, uh, the brethren that have been ordained should also be able when go to mission work and ordain more and put more people ready to go and do the work in those areas so that they don't have to travel every single time. People are still feel scantily around, but if people can get to do the work like uh, Elder here, that would be beautiful because then he would be able to cover that region without necessarily people traveling all that distance. And so that would be beautiful for me if that's according to the law of your land is something that is viable and something that is possible. Why not have it? I mean, I would have it if it if they will not attach some conditions to it. If they attach some conditions to it, I would be scared. But if I they give really go use it to where you have, you paid your money and you know your Bible teaches, praise the Lord. The pioneers had papers with which they worked with, which they gave among themselves. But I also know that for sure, God doesn't want us to bring the time of trouble before. If they will cause chaos, just because I don't have this and there's a way I can get it without violating any of the laws of God, I'll do it so that the work of God can continue. So apply wisdom on that, pray, and God will show you what to do. So, Brother Sadok, I'm thinking about John the Baptist, his disciples baptized, and that was at yes. the same time when uh, Christ's disciples baptized, and they were not ordained, you know, they, they <laughs> hardly knew Christ, probably, you know, they did not understand everything, and so, in my mind, I would think, you know, why, I mean, you are baptizing, right, and you are not a minister, so... Why make it more difficult when you want to follow Christ and it is a public uh, 
uh, you know, saying that I want to follow Christ, why cannot somehow anyone who are converted baptize? I think that brings us to another stage of church developments that as the church grows, there is need of order. As the church is in its infant stages, there is no much of those regulations. But you could see that as the church was growing in the book of apostles, they saw the need of bringing in deacons and bringing in elders. Why was that necessary? That was necessary to keep off walls because a situation will come. And we have experienced it in our country where everyone was baptizing and realized that some of them did not even have approval of good Christian standards. And so that is, that's the scary part. They might be believing the truth, but they're not fit to be ministers at all. They do not have moral standards. Some have two wives. Some are cheating on their wives. These are things that we've seen. Some are messing up with young people in church, but they're all saying, oh, everyone can baptize. And so they jeopardize the life of those who have been baptized because when someone comes and realizes, I was baptized by that elder only to realize that he has two wives. Now they've even been questioned whether, should I go back to the water? How is, you know, so the church is, is in a, a shambolic state. People are questioning. And so as the church grows, that need arises. But the spirit of prophecy and the Bible itself gives room for a church that is growing. And that is the stage where we are in. But even in these stages, there is an ordination. They are walking with Christ and Christ is a faithful servant of God. He is an apostle according to Hebrews of God. So they have the Christ has chosen them and Christ knows them. The case of John, John is known. So those who are following him, we are assuming that John knows them. Right? So we are assuming that John has rightly trained them and taught them on how they ought to live. Their qualifications to be an elder. Their qualifications to be... In Kenya, we have women baptizing. Do you see how dangerous that is? Mm -hmm. And then now you can see the whole mess. So... If their ministers are working under the direction of a brother, they need to have the blessings of that brother if it's been known to be in faith. The problem is as the church is growing, there are many people who will come and carry that name. We are one true God believers. But what they want to do is they want to use that influence to destroy the entire movement. And then what will be done is they'll say, isn't this the same movement where people behave this way? That's what we've heard. Isn't this the same movement where people disappear with church money? Isn't this the same movement that people are immoral? But it was one man that the church or the brethren did not even see as fit for ministry. And so that is why God did place it so clearly that ministers should be checked by church members. They should be checked if they are living according to the standards. Elders, deacons, these things destroy the influence of the truth than doctrine would do. And that's what Satan is waiting for. So I would by all means say that you are right, Sister Eva. We necessarily don't need to go to ministerial schools. But I believe that we don't need to go there to be ordained or to be set apart to work for God. You need to show fruit that you are a faithful servant of God. Once you show the fruit, then the church, and the church is who? It's you and me. It's the people around me that believe like me. Being able to show clearly that this brother is dedicated to the work of God, and we have no bad report about him. Anyway, Brother Wycliffe, I want to say thank you so much, uh, Brother Sadok, for attending and sharing this, uh, you know, very important subject with us. So maybe I can ask you, Brother Wycliffe, would you like to have the closing prayer, please? We are so much thankful for such a wonderful time like this. We thank you for the uh, suggestions admonitions on our true condition and how we need to seek Christ. We pray, dear God, that 
you may be with us, continue to move in the hearts of men and the movement that you're creating that can finish the work. We pray that your message for this. Amen. Amen.